Welcome to Lectionary Call-In for Tuesday, June 29th of 2021. For two laypersons, a pastor and an academician gather for about 50 minutes each week to discuss the Gospel Lectionary for the coming Sunday, and this Sunday is July 4th. Each Tuesday, we call in from wherever we may be at 6.30 a.m. Eastern Time, and for our friend Charles Willard in Minnesota, that's 5.30 a.m. Our little team's working to be faithful to Lectionary Year B, and we hope this discussion will provide areas of focus and reflection. Here's how it works. We develop perspectives independently after the lead-off person <coughs> shares informative questions, and then in this virtual discussion room, we share, encourage, and challenge each other. And here are the folks joining us in today's discussion. Sarah Mickelson from Tampa, Florida. Bill Hall, St. Petersburg, Florida. Can't hear you, Charles. <laughs> Charles Willard, located in Minnesota. <laughs> Thank you. And this is Don Upton in Charlotte, North Carolina. Good to have everybody on board today. And speaking of leadoff persons, that's Sarah Mickelson. Look forward to hearing your questions. How you doing? I'm well this morning. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. And uh, we are in the book of Mark. I think that's what year B does, keeps us in Mark. Um, we're looking at Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Um, Jesus has just uh, had the experience of healing the daughter of Jairus, um, and the healing of the woman that touches his hem has taken place. Um, and we are now dropping into the chapter that just follows after that. Starting with verse 1. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all of this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done with his hands? Is this not the carpenter? the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deeds of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went out among the villages teaching, and he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and gave them the authority over clean, unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, where Ever you, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any in that place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent, and they cast out many demons, anointed with oil many who were sick, and cured them. And that ends the reading of our scripture this morning. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Having just come home from uh, visiting a hometown, I thought about the limitations of of hometowns and 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 what where they put you mentally and how you uh, how you respond to people there who have seen you at your youngest, at your most foolish, at your most um, I should say unwise moments. And I'm thinking about the connection between the unbelief of those in his hometown and Jesus' ability to do deeds of power. What does that tell us about God and, and about human nature? So two questions really tucked into this one. What's the relationship between the unbelief and Jesus' ability to do deeds of power. And what do we learn about God? And what do we observe about human nature in, rela in relationship to this particular connection? 
Um, Bill, do you have any thoughts? Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the question. Um, I did a uh, search based on the new Revised Standard Version translation, and several things struck me. I looked up uh, believe, belief, and then uh, faith. And uh, believe, belief occur 15 times and faith eight times. And several observations. One is this word is used across the whole of Mark. It's literally <clears throat> in the first and last chapters. Um, so it's obviously uh, an important part of Jesus' ministry. This is not the only time that he um, draws attention to belief or unbelief. And, and a couple of quick observations. It, the statement that he could do little there, I, it, it's a mystery, and I don't fully understand it. I think we've mentioned this before. The, it, it, I wouldn't want to say that we can keep God from accomplishing what God wants to do. I don't believe that. I do believe we have the capacity for ourselves, as it were, to limit the power of the good news. We, we, can, res, we can resist it. Um, an example from our own history as a nation, the issue of slavery um, and how long it has taken us uh, as a nation and as people of faith to embrace the good news that all people are created equal and that all are equally children of God. So that uh, the followers of the way, yes, we made the point several times that I agree with, we need to avoid becoming judgmental about the people in Jesus's hometown because we're among them. We have our ways of not believing and, and not embracing. And it strikes me that, and I think maybe you hinted at this, uh, uh, the, the hometown people are judging people by his past. Well, you know, look, look at his parentage. Uh, you know, his brothers and sisters are here and who are they? His father was uh, some sort of uh, common home builder. And the people Jesus is able to help are dealing with him in the here and now. Now, this was a poor analogy. But I grew up in what is now the First Presbyterian Church of Maitland. When I was a child, it was called Maitland Presbyterian, been founded in the 1800s. According to the then self-appointed church historian, a woman in her 90s, I was the first person ever in the history of the church to come to go into the ministry. And when I was... Um, Going off to college to finish my two, my senior year, having gone to a junior college, the minister insisted on my preaching in the home church. When I stood up there, I saw the man who taught me in second grade Sunday school. <laughs> I, you get the picture that I'm, I'm drawing. And it was, a, to put it mildly, an, an unnerving experience to stand there. And, and there were people who came up to me. And now they were all very positive, but it was like, Bill, I remember you when you were just this little kid. And it's a taking, because that's the first time I'd ever spoken in church. And it, all I'm saying is that I have some empathy for the, the people. Like, you know, here's this little kid who's now <laughs> in college and decided to go into the ministry. Anyway, as I say, it's not a great analogy, but I have some some empathy. Now, um, back to my word study. This is stating the obvious. People of it is not people who are acknowledged to have faith are both Jews and Gentiles. That's a subtle but important message. It's not limited to the the Israelites. That all people are capable of belief or unbelief, um, and. It, it seems to me that um, – let me use this example. In the last chapter of Mark, toward the end of that 
16th chapter. We're, I'll just read it. Jesus upbraided the disciples for the lack of faith because they had not believed those who saw him after he was risen. And then immediately it says he commissioned them, go into all the world and proclaim the good news of the whole creation. That had never caught my attention before. You, you get what I'm saying? He challenges them for unbelief and then says, you're the ones who are going to carry the message. And I find some um, assurance in that, that I don't have to have perfect faith. I don't have to have it all together. Jesus says, you folks don't really believe. And by the way, go out there and um, carry the message. So those are my thoughts for the moment, Sarah. Thank you for the question. Thank you. So the connection between unbelief and the hometown crowd and Jesus' ability to do deeds of power, and what does that tell us about God and human nature? Um, Don, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I, I appreciate the question, too. I'm attracted to the opinions of the commentaries built around the concept of there are no deeds of power like healing because they didn't ask. And I've got a notation at the top of the uh, scripture I carry with me, and it's from Bill Wallace. He used to teach the lectionary class at Palmas here at Presbyterian Church, and it just says, because they didn't ask. <laughs> and I'd forgotten about that. Uh, is, is the ability to do the deed of power connected to the desire to engage, uh, to repent, to request the healing? Uh, so I, I came up with a few variations of that which would be, or maybe I should say explanations, they, of they didn't ask. The first I would act out and say, well, wh why would I ask anything of him? I know who he is. Or let me get this straight. I have to be insulted by his behavior, and then I have to ask him for help? Are you kidding me? Uh, or who he is, his origin story, which I am intimately familiar because he grew up here, and I'm unable to work through what he's doing and the fact of his family and his childhood and his village. I can't connect the two things at all. Or uh, it is not occurring to his hometown residents that Jesus is a destination for anything except, except getting their walls fixed. And, and I think it's a key point that nothing can or should change that. He's the guy you call if you want your wall fixed. Uh, and nothing can change that at all. Any alternative is an insult to one's intelligence. Or I'll, you know, I'll play it out as a hometown person. You insult my intelligence if you tell me X is actually Y. It doesn't work for me. Don't call me stupid. And I think it's important that the presence of Jesus in his home village is not set up to just hearsay and rumor either. It's not like he shows up and people are saying, well, we're hearing things and we don't know who he is. Uh, let's figure it out. Things are actually happening. And this text says his voice as a teacher is authority. So it's not that people say this just can't be. The nuance is they say in this story what's happening just doesn't line up with clear thinking and experience. Uh, my human brothers and sisters, thinking back to what you were just talking about, Bill, 2,000 years ago, are so confident in their worldview that they, I feel like I'm them. I'm just as confident. Yikes. If they can't see Jesus and turn around and see him and ask him to exert his authority, then, then I probably can't either. So yeah, I heard your caution about don't be a critic. I'm not being a critic. I, I think I'm just as confident as them are, they are that I can't change or turn around in my opinion of somebody. I, I wrote in my uh, my, my uh, Bible a few, a few years ago that, the, that this could be a temptation of Christ too, uh, like a temptation in the wilderness of your hometown. Question mark. Uh, if it's a temptation of Christ then it's a, a turn on another gospel story of temptation. In your home village, let me try this. In your home village, just go to a high place and throw yourself down and let the neighbors see the angels catch you, and then that will settle everything. I think in this story, it answers that temptation question by saying, 
I'll, I'll play the role of somebody in the village. Yes, the angels caught him. But in my experience, angels don't come to the aid of carpenters. Nah. That's my best shot, Sarah. Oh, thank you. Charles, do you have any thoughts? My, my thought is that it's more complicated than that, and I can't figure out a way to unroll it any better. Um, it didn't It didn't say, well, it does say in verse 5, that he could do no deed of power there. But then it continues, except, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. Well, isn't that miraculous? I just, I mean, I don't. I, we we think well we read the text and the text says that you know it didn't it didn't work but in fact Mark goes ahead and says that it did work and in Luke who is dealing with the same material uh, Luke has a quite different reason for the, the the people being upset with Jesus which did not have to do with he was a hometown kid or whatever but was simply because. But he didn't like the fact that he preached about uh, the gospel being made available to foreigners. All the people in his narrative who he, who he talked about as being identified as being receiving the blessings of God were Gentiles. So I'm, I'm it's, 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 It's like saying, well, he, he, he didn't make a billion dollars. He only made a few million dollars. Both are incredible things. And yet we say, you know, we, we, we like the people of his hometown say, well, he can't do anything. But in fact, he did. Now, I agree with you, Charles. I think that there is a note here that says he was able to do some deeds of power in this community but only for those who needed it. And I I have this conundrum. You know, Sunday afternoons are my grocery shopping time, and, and generally I'm inquiring with my family what they might want to see on the dinner table during the week so that I might accommodate a meal that they will enjoy, or maybe I just need some creativity because I'm kind of bored with cooking chicken a hundred different ways, and I'm, I need 101 options. And so I will inquire with them what they want me to purchase from the grocery store, and my timing is almost always flawed because I ask them when they're not hungry. I ask them when they've already eaten. I ask them after they've filled their bellies so full they can't possibly talk about food anymore, and I'm I'm woefully at a loss. So it struck me that maybe what we're seeing is it's human nature to be curious about something when we need it and and pass something over when we perceive we don't. Um, that was my first thought. My second thought is, yeah, there is some, uh, I would say, bias in the line of thinking that that takes us down the path of, well, he's only a carpenter and he's the son of Mary and the brother of all these other people that they list out. And it's almost as if they can't see Jesus for anything more than what they already know. So I'm with you, Bill. I think they're looking at the past. Um, And they're limiting the future by what they can imagine is possible. And they haven't figured out yet that with God, all things are possible. The other thing I, I, I thought about is uh, human beings are generally comfortable being right until proven wrong. And, and we can be zealous in that, in, in that being right stuff. Um, and, and then we don't take the being wrong part very well. And I think that's part of the story that they weren't curious, they weren't hungry, they didn't need anything from Jesus. They already knew who he was, and, and and they basically said, no, thank you. We already have enough fuller brushes. Go to the next house. And and I wonder how often we pass by miracles and moments of, of sacred thought and sacred interaction when we um, when we practice this, I already know, 
I'm not curious. I'm not hungry. I'm not in need. And and basically, I'm I'm right till I'm proven wrong. How many times do we miss the blessings of God with those perspectives? And and I think we see this reiterated across all the gospels, and and the life of Jesus. Um, it culminates, of course, in Jerusalem, when they go, No, we appreciate you bringing us eternal life, but you know we're happy here. We can see that you know Tuesday is going to be a great day for fishing. Um, Wednesday might be a day when we have leftovers and. And heck, you know, the Romans aren't too bad. Never mind the foot on my neck. So I think it's interesting that you're only hungry and you only need things when you when you actually need them or you're hungry for them. And up until that point, they're just like, meh, leftovers. Not really hungry for that. So I, I, that struck me about human nature that how enamored we are with the novelty of things, but sometimes we forget that there's this wonderful discipline and, and ritual and, and sacredness that comes from seeing fresh, seeing with fresh eyes every time. So that, that's my connection to human nature and God and, and, and how does this unbelief, it's not Jesus being limited, it's the people being limited. Um. The next question has to do with Jesus is sending these 12 out in in pairs with specific orders. And the specific orders have to do with don't take things with you. Take exactly this and nothing more. And the experience of hometown rejection, they get that as the backdrop. And then they're told to go out with what I would call basically T-shirts and a short pair of shorts and a pair of flip-flops. And they're told to go visiting. Go spread the good news. And I thought about this. I said, how does this equip this experience of hometown rejection? How does this equip or imbue the disciples as they go out in pairs? Don, you want to tackle this one first? Well, I'll I'll start with uh, repeating, I I think, what you said about uh, humans are comfortable being right until being proven wrong. I think comfortable are, are, uh, are humans are comfortable being right all the time, and the hometown is uh, exhibit A about how that how that works, and it's because I think hometowns have that today we call it the echo chamber power that we we create echo chambers for ourselves so we can feel comfortable about what we say and what we believe so that we can co reinforce uh, everything with each other and boy the hometown has that power. So he breaks them up so that they're going out in twos instead of the single individuals. And I I think what's involved, I think you're looking for a comparison between the the hometown experience and the world. So I'd say the the judgment of somebody's capabilities or skills or authority, friendliness or intent or faith are powerful, the judgments, especially if you're one person. If you're the other, uh, the ability to re- jump to judgment on any of those things is pretty easy because you're walking into this giant echo chamber of a community, which could be your hometown. And so it requires an alongside person that to be an advocate, a witness, a reinforcer, a helper. Sound familiar? So Jesus directs that there must be alongside people, almost paraclete, right, to to be a helper as you walk into these echo systems, of these echo chambers uh, for reinforcing people's opinions. And it's, it, I used to think, well, that's how big and scary it is, but I also say that's how big and powerful two are, that it only takes one more to change the dialogue. So today... Uh, it's hard to stand up to an echo chamber of society or culture, media, politics. Uh, So I'm wondering off of what does the good news echo? And the answer is it echoes off of my friend who walks at my side. And I think the analogy is the paraclete. That's all it takes uh, with the power of the gospel. I think it's also a reminder that human beings can reject anything 
especially if they team up. And every community, every culture, every politic is a team, always, I think, built in part to be able to team up against the opposition. But it only takes two to change that. One more thing I was thinking about is the the direction mm-hmm. about um, staying in one place. If I were on my own, and I was going into a new community, and I was being judged, and I was fighting my way into some understanding or maybe to get a meal, I might, what Bill Wallace words would be, I'd shop around. And a partner, at least that's Bill, that was Bill's explanation of why you don't jump from house to house to house. You abide or stay in one place all around. He'd say, that means don't shop around. But to help reinforce that, the partner is alongside of the helper to make sure that we stop around. Uh, the art of the stay is to stay one place, and I think it just takes a second person so that we can remind each other we're not supposed to shop around. Those are my thoughts, Sarah. Thank you, Don. Charles, do you have any thoughts? Not right now. Bill. He sends the 12 out with specific orders and experience, and the experience of hometown rejection. How does this equip or imbue them as they go out in pairs? Well, for me, <clears throat> the first comment I'd make is one of the most powerful ways to teach is by example. Mm-hmm. Um, in Mark's account, right after he's rejected, it says, then Jesus went about among the villages teaching. So Jesus moved on. And Luke's account, after, as Charles has noted, a different explanation for the rejection, um, it says Jesus passed through the midst of them and went on his way. So first of all, Jesus sets an example. He doesn't stay there and argue with them. He doesn't try to defend himself. He moved on. And then commissioned the disciples, as you said, to to travel lightly uh, and to go out in pairs. So Jesus is demonstrating first what he later says in this part of Mark, shake the dust off your feet if you're rejected. He doesn't say that and then do it. He does it and then teaches it. And a subtle thing, but I, I think it's important because example is – a powerful way to teach. Um, now, um, clearly, Jesus is teaching a lesson on how to respond to rejection. The human nature is to emotionally put our dukes up, to try to defend ourselves. Uh, instead, Jesus turns and walks away. We remember the story of the Samaritan village that rejected and the disciples, did they want to pray for the Samaritans? Did they want to respond with kindness? They wanted to bring fire down from heaven. And Jesus said, let's go, let's, let's go somewhere else. And I think it is also Sarah, a preparation for what Jesus says when he's about to ascend, I will be with you always. It's an, going out in pairs. They, they are going, in one sense, they're going out without Jesus. But Jesus is with them. God is, is with them. Um, and, and I will simply echo Don's comments about working with others and how that can help us gain perspective to have someone else uh, to share with us at times, restrain us. And, and that challenges our Western world, Lone Ranger, rugged individualism. And it reminds me, it always struck me as a little strange that Jesus says, where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst. Now, that doesn't mean that when I'm alone, one of my favorite parts of the day is private meditation, especially as possible outside at sunrise. I believe God is there, but I think there is something special about two or three are gathered. Um, and I had a powerful experience of that as a child. In my day, 
It was church twice on Sunday and once in the middle of the week. My father was an elder, clerk of session, and he led the Wednesday night prayer meeting. And one night, my mother stayed home with my brother and sister. One of them was sick or something. And dad and I get to the church, and this tremendous thunderstorm comes, and nobody shows up. So after about five, 15 minutes, I said, okay, dad, let, let's go home. He said, no, we're two or three. And my father and I stayed there, and each of us prayed and spent time in silence. Uh, and, and I remember uh, that made an impression on me. It also is reminding us you don't have to have a stadium full of people to feel the power of God. And I think, Don, back to your point, again, we can have our individual relationship, but there is a quality to doing something together. We four are an example of that. I I look forward to how our different life experiences and perceptions uh, hopefully blend in a way that it, that is helpful to ourselves. First of all, we're learning from each other. We're not just here helping <laughs> those who listen or view it later. So I think there's a, um, a strength in knowing that we are not alone. Um, and I think it is a lesson we need to keep learning. The pandemic has challenged us to learn new ways to share the good news. And so I, that, those are my thoughts at the moment, Sarah. Thank you. Um, everything I always wanted to know and everything I needed to know, I learned in kindergarten, right? You never cross the street without holding the hand of someone and standing in pairs and going together because that's, that's a frightening experience. And, Things that are frightening are less frightening when you have a partner, when you have a, a, a friend to go with you, right? So when you're little, um, if you have to do something that's kind of scary, you want somebody to go with you, like get up in the middle of the night and go get a drink of water. Um, so I find this very lovely that Jesus gives them this sense of buddy systems. And, you know, growing up, having a buddy was the best thing. It meant you weren't alone, that there was somebody else like you that had the similar experience or, or an outlook um, that that you could go, yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. So I think that that's an essential hint of Jesus's when he gives this opportunity to the disciples. It requires cooperation, not something being one person leading and one person following all the time. So I think that there's a model here that Jesus is, is giving us that's effective. Um, you know, we're told in Scripture that we, if we have a particular issue with somebody, we're to go and, and, uh, and address them personally, one-on-one with someone else, a third party. Um, not to reinforce whether we're right and wrong, but to keep us from going off the rails. I think that's important, too. Um it strikes me that they have to see rejection and how it looks um, in its full form. Before you can send somebody out, you have to show them, okay, here's the worst case scenario right here. This is what's the worst thing that could happen. You're going to go someplace where everybody knows you, and they're going to tell you to go away. We already know, you're, you know we don't want what you have to offer. I think it's important that that they see that, that even Jesus gets rejected. I think that's important because uh, they would be, it would be easy to withdraw and stop trying if we were to say, yeah, but he was Jesus. That's why he could always walk on water. So I think it's valuable that they see that even Jesus has those moments where people reject what he has to offer. Um, I think that's it's valuable. That's really valuable. Um, I, I like the idea that Jesus can equip them, and it's also a lesson for us going into Charles's dialogue about what it meant and what it means. I think it's important for us as well because we need to be reminded of what we are able and capable of. 
And if these disciples went out and were able to do deeds of power and heal people and pray over people and bring good news to people, then then we might be able to as well. Um, so I think it's about endeavor. I think it's about safety. I think it's about um, being vulnerable. Um, they're told to go out with hardly anything um, to make themselves completely dependent upon the people they're going to meet, to to need the people as much as they need this message. So there's this wonderful opportunity for people to step into a gap. People, if surprisingly, people like to be able to do things for you. For the general rule of that appeals to their good nature, it makes them seem generous and 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 it gives them an opportunity to step up instead of step back. I think that's really important. Um, so it's something that offers the community into which they travel an easy way to connect with them. I can see you don't have any money. I can see you don't have any place to go. Would you like something to eat? Um, I think that's really telling that Jesus puts them in a position where their need is obvious. And how often are we that comfortable with vulnerability that we would travel that way? Or that we would take a message to someone in that condition? And I would dare say that we're not that comfortable being that vulnerable. Right? I was taught to be self-sufficient. Pull myself up by my bootstraps. Take everything I need on my own back. Travel like a snail and have my own home. So... I think it's interesting that we go with vulnerability. We go in a pair. We go because we need our paraclete-ish person with us. And that we are able to be rejected. I think that's important, that we are able to be rejected. Um, I think those are all things that Jesus models in this particular transition between the visit to the hometown and sending out the 12, Um, that that even Jesus gets rejected. We need to be vulnerable. We need a partner to keep us from falling off the road or or, or jumping too quickly into um, rejection, because that might also be important. Um, So I I think that this is a, a wonderful teaching by example. Now let me tell you what you've learned kind of a moment. Question number three. It's an interesting transition here. There's a shift in the Gospel of Mark. Up until this point in time, disciples have been observers, witnesses of Jesus doing deeds of power, of Jesus performing miracles, of Jesus' teaching. And at this point, the story shifts into the disciples doing deeds of power and spreading the Gospel and practicing, if you will, the wings that might lead them out of the nest and make them more successful as an independent or a pair um, to provide the gospel's reach to everybody else. So at this point, the disciples begin doing the miraculous work as well. And I'm thinking about this messianic secret that we see kind of ribboning through the book of Mark and how this shift might illuminate Jesus' reason. Um, behind this consistent instructions to tell no one. So what are your thoughts about the shift in in action? And how does that relate to the messianic secret, if if there is such a thing, in the book of Mark? Charles, do you have any thoughts? No, I, I may come back later, though. Okay. Bill? Got any ideas or, or thoughts about this? Again, thank you for the questions. Very thought-provoking. Uh, several observations. I first would be that timing is important. Uh, it is. It seems a bit mysterious because it's not only the disciples who are at times told not to report. He sometimes says that to the person who is healed. So it, it, it seems to me at least we can say. 
Jesus was illustrating, wait a minute, this isn't about dazzling people with a miracle. Like Don said earlier, people can uh, rationalize even what seems to be miraculous. I think you said, Don, angels don't catch carpenters or, or however you said it. Um, and so I, that's an impression that I carry about this. It's like, wait a minute, yes, the healing and the feeding of the thousand is important. It's an illustration of the good news, but it's not primarily about amazing people because amazement only lasts for a while. And in this journey of faith, take some real grit and willingness to deal with the grime of life uh, and ministry. So one is the timing. It reminds me of what I think is attributed as a so-called Zen proverb. When the pupil is ready, the teacher will appear. Uh, Educational people make much of, of timing and sequencing and age appropriate and so forth. I'm a reading coach in the elementary school and part of our coaching is to meet the kids where they are and the books that we use are purposely using vocabulary that will both stretch them, but meet them where they are. Again, timing is important. Um, I think another part of it is that the disciples needed to gain some maturity, some um, length of experience before they could go out and and teach others. Now, they didn't arrive. Jesus, we are told, upbraided his disciples at times for the lack of belief. But then, as I've already noted, sent them out. So he doesn't wait till they're perfect. It also, and this may not speak directly to your question, and I'm using now modern Western business terminology and applying it to Scripture. Jesus was a good delegator. One of the worst things to do if you delegate something is then micromanage it, again, using our modern terms. There are reports of the disciples coming back and being amazed at how receptive some people were. I don't remember a single place where Jesus says, okay, let's debrief what you did and let me critique. You shouldn't have said that. You should have said this. He simply sends them out, and they come back and report whatever they report. I don't hear or remember any evaluation. And I can tell you, and I'm sure all of us have experienced it, delegation is difficult, especially if you want things done right. You know, um, and again, if you delegate and then keep looking over the shoulder of the person that you delegated, uh, first of all, they're going to be a little fearful and hesitant. And Jesus acts on that belief that the best way to learn is by doing. Uh, so um, uh, that would, those again would be my thoughts of the moment, Sarah. Don? What okay. do you, yeah, tell me, tell me what you're thinking. Well, I'm, I'm listening. And uh, first, Bill, I think your, the quote I wrote down was, timing is important, right? You said that. And Sarah earlier said, Mo- there are moments when people reject what he has to offer. So I'm going to put those together, timing and moments. And then here are the disciples now venturing out, but we've got this secret that's out there. And and I'm trying to make sense of that. But you both talked about timing and moments. And I'm wondering if this is a challenge to think about stories that are in time and for human beings time dependent. Remember last week, Jesus is not in time, but the healing still takes place. The daughter has passed away, but it doesn't matter. They're out of time. And some of these stories are out of time. So how do we, with the secret, I, I'm wondering if this is kind of an Old Testament making straight the way for the Lord. The secret is still hovering out there in time and out of time. Maybe that's where Jesus is so frustrated sometimes. You don't see it now, now, now. He's got this eagerness about it. But that's out of time. That's an eternal question. And then we've got these stories in time that resonate. This is a story 2,000 years ago. And we're fairly confident we're talking about hometowns. 
Uh, that's out of time as well. So as they go out, I think they're making straight the way of the Lord. And I was trying to think of some analogies for out of time in the scripture. And so I'll, I'll just try one on that's kind of Christ-like and where a story, a rejection or a lack of awareness hovers out there, but the seed is planted. And we've been using seeds as analogies the last few weeks as well. So what's a good example of that? I'm going to offer up, I'll go to one point in time, a family that is starving, on the move, broken, desperate, uprooted, truly refugees with nothing, torn apart, and I'll emphasize starving, no sense of future, in time, all right? Backtrack, let's tell another part of the story that is both in time and out of time. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And when his brothers saw their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a word to him. And Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers. They hated him all the more. And he said to them, listen to the dream I had. We were binding sheaves to grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose up, stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine, bowed down to it. And his brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because his dream and what he had said. And he had another dream and he told his brothers, listen, he said, I had another dream and this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. Well, you know the rest of the story. Then in time, and out of time. So I think there's a connection here in terms of making straight the way of the Lord, doing preparation work, because we're all together in this, in our story. There is a familiarity. Even in our hometown, it may take a little longer because we're so clear about what we think we know and we don't. But Joseph popped into my mind as, Bill, the timing is important. Can I grasp what the future will bring? And we've always got our, our, our leaps to conclusions about our little brother and who he is. And then the moments when people reject what has to, what has to be offered, and we have to be confronted with that another time so the disciples are out there making straight the way of the Lord so that people will ask. Now, maybe not add it all up, but I'm going back to Bill Wallaf in a question on this, you know, years ago. It's like, why, was, why wasn't why Jesus not expressing his authority in his hometown? And Bill said, well, because he didn't ask, <laughs> because nobody asked. So that's my best shot, uh, Sarah. So I wonder about Jesus' caution here about making the, the important thing the message and not the messenger. I think, I think there's this the sense of, in contrast to Roman deities that were roaming the country, if you will, Jesus needs to express the fact that this is a living God, that this is a a, a, a relationship with an active partner, not a piece of stone. And if the message becomes the most important thing, then it will it will be a living relationship. If the messenger becomes the important thing, it will become a, a yet another deity in the pantheon of Roman activity. So I, I'm curious about that in that Jesus says, no, what we do together is stronger than what we do alone. And that we are called to work together in the fields of the Lord and not go to the museum and worship a statue. And that's the the the, the anxiety, or I shouldn't say, I, there, that word is not the right word, but that's the, um, the misstep that could occur or that could be um, memorialized, like this is the place where Jesus slept and this is the house where Jesus grew up and this is the... This is the the grave where Jesus was, you know, put in the, the tomb. And it becomes memorialized instead of a living, breathing, practicing relationship of faith. And so if the story becomes the what we do together versus the who did it, 
it has legs. It moves forward. It becomes a living and sustaining um, evidence of a relationship with the living God instead of um, a deity that we visit every once in a while when we're walking through that particular city in that particular place at that particular time. So I think about the messenger being Jesus wanting to go, wait a minute, let's not make this about the messenger. Let's make the message the most important thing. And and, and so that's kind of how I'm thinking about the messianic secret that Mark hints, to, hints about as he tells people, even the people he heals, don't tell anybody about this. I don't want you walk, I don't want to walk through a community and have you point at me and say that's the man that did it or you know that's going to eliminate the, the flexibility of God to build this into what it needs to be built into. So I I wondered about that. Um and the learning by doing I think is essential. Um I think uh Paul is spot on when he says alone I can do nothing but with Christ all things are possible. I think that that's that's an amplification of this particular um, story, and I find that to be very helpful. Um, I think it's important that when you are raising kids who don't quite know what it means to clean the kitchen, you don't stand over them and yell at them and tell them how to clean the kitchen. You clean the kitchen with them. You give them a wipe, and you get a wipe, and you wipe down the counters when you're done. You go, now, that's what it should look like when you're finished. You you work with them. You do it together instead of telling them to go and do it. And I think that's essential because then they're not doing it alone. It's a game that becomes more fun. You know, it, it's something that you can do that becomes a memory step instead of a um, a moment of failure. I think that's essential. Um, And so I I really liked the observation. This is the first time in Mark we see the story moving from Jesus being the one that does the thing and humanity being the the people that watch the thing into Jesus and humanity doing the thing together. I think that for me was valuable Um, and, and, and and a very insightful thought about what's the easiest way to to get to know somebody, but to do something with them, right? You go to Haiti not to just build the greenhouse, but to build the greenhouse with the people that are going to benefit from the greenhouse. That makes the story rich. Now, if you're just the silly, crazy people that come from the States to do things on the weeks that they're there and the Haitians all watch you, there's no real lesson, except that, wow, you guys get sunburned fast. I I think it's valuable to interact and to do the thing together. I think that's the sweetest sweetest part about this. I'm done. Charles, do you have anything you want to add? I'm wondering exactly what the disciples said when they went out, repent uh, and believe, are they being asked to believe in Jesus? Or are they being asked to exercise their faith that they've had from their parents and their grandparents? We don't know. And I'm just I'm just now thinking of you know, what what they actually said when they were speaking to these people that they went to visit and were living with and and then what happened when they healed? Um, I mean, what did they say? It's, it's, it's they go out. And they came back and they said, "Well, it, it was it was great. You know, people got healed and people repented." And it's, but then they fall back into their old ways <laughs> once they come back. I have that problem with teenagers too. <laughs> Well, folks, uh, we are out of time. And so to wrap up, I'll let everybody listening or watching know that Palmas here Presbyterian Church is at 3501 West San Jose Street. That's in Tampa, Florida. And for more information, you can go to palmasia.org. That's P-A-L-M-A-C-E-I-A.org. And at that site, you will hear 
other discussions of the same lectionary passage with other opinions sometimes, great sermons, reflections, prayer, and outstanding music, so we commend that site to you. And you're always welcome, and we'll see you next time.